and we're live. Hello all and welcome back to the Invictus stream. My name is always Mr. Harlan Guthrie and I am here once again with the one and only, the extremely talented and quite funny, my wife, Mrs. Joe Guthrie. Hello. We are joined once again by Dimension Door's own host, GM extraordinaire, and my friend, Mr. James Schwartz. Oh, hello. Coming back to join us from Dice Shame and my Facebook friend, the one and only <laughs> Rob Diobald. <laughs> and of course, tonight, the GM extraordinaire, uh, William A. Weller. Tonight, we bring you a first Mork Borg adventure. Heck yeah. Rock and roll and intimidation. Both sound effects at the same time. Because this game is a little bit of both. Uh, welcome, one and all. If this is your first time uh, watching the Invictus stream, welcome. We stream role-playing games every Wednesday at 8. It's very chill, relaxing, like hanging out with your friends, because we're all friends here. Uh, so, welcome. A big shout out to William for running tonight's one-shot game. My pleasure. Harlan, thank you so much for sending me the rule books in this game. Hey, uh, you the, the you more turned I, me on to it, so... Yeah, well, the more I looked into it, like, this is a game that is still D20-based, familiar to all you Dungeons & Dragons players, but it goes a little bit more into that sort of heavy metal, dark fantasy, um, really kind of a, a gritty magical world that's falling apart. And, and uh, the layout I, is insane. It's beautiful. <sighs> yeah, it's the, the book arc is unsettling and grisly and inspiring all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's so crazy. It's and like Arlene, since steady. we walk this line of horror all the time, I thought it would be a fun foray for us. Uh, one of these I'm nights. ready. I'm ready to get ritually <laughs> eviscerated. Uh, <laughs> I'm so ready. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm really excited. But before we jump into that, a quick shout out to who's all here and all that wonderful stuff. Of course, uh, you can check out our lovely, uh, not this lovely GM, but this lovely GM, Joe. <laughs> and uh, Frob on Dice Shame. Uh, Frob, give him the website for Dice Shame. Uh, DiceShame.com is probably it, but I should probably <laughs> check it. <laughs> Quiz me on that one. Google it. DiceShamePodcast.com. Dice Dice mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so nice to have you on the show, Rob. It's been a while. It's been a while. I'm excited to play this one. Yeah. It's, well, your, your mic is going a little bit weird. Yeah, you sound well, worse uh, than Alex did oh, yesterday. We don't love that. Um, mm -mm. Might just be peaking or something. Maybe turn it down a little bit. Could you say well, exterminate three times? Exterminate, yeah. exterminate, exterminate. That's really uh, close. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, we can still understand you. It's not like a lag or anything like that, so it doesn't really matter. Oh. If anything, you could make it into a character because it kind of sounds like a real old man crackle, <laughs> kind of. Uh, but far away. It. Inspiration. Well, I'll let you think about that for a second or figure that out if you want. Um, James, uh, of course, from the one and only Dimension Door podcast. Um, <laughs> the new episode today? No, oh, nothing Saturday today, today, but this okay. Saturday we're releasing uh, early for patrons, and then next episode is going to be out in a week on Wednesday. Hell yeah. I mean, a week today. And a, a week from today, yes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> And a new episode of Hello from the Hallow Woods. Uh, right, William? As, as every Wednesday, indeed. Tell them what they won. <laughs> it's a big day, Wednesdays. Wednesdays yes. are huge. Middle Wednesdays of the week. Day. It's, yeah. it's like exactly. this part right yep. here. That's sweet, <laughs> sweet, 4 to 5 a.m. Yeah. Uh, and obviously a new episode of the aforementioned Dice Shane podcast will be coming out. Uh, tomorrow morning at 1.20 a.m. That's right. For the min-max oh, roll. Dice Shame Eve, really. If you... Ah, that's right. <laughs> Dice Shame Good. Eve. Uh, yeah, you're not crackling anymore, but you are a little bit quiet now. But we can always All turn right. down to I... compensate. No, I'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> He's almost Tech there. Wizard. Ladies Speaking of wizard. Uh, yeah, if you haven't seen or listened to Dice Shame yet, uh, check it out. We don't pump it too much on here because it's kind of an assumed. But since I know a lot of Hello from the Hallowoods people are coming here tonight to see you in your prime, uh, make sure you check out DiceShamePodcast.com. This uh, lovely man in the blue glasses plays a adorable wizard and uh, cute, my yeah. lovely wife. He's very cute. 
I have to say that. Like, Jack is. He he is. He, that is. Yeah. That's an accurate statement for Jack. I mean, Jack your is familiar cute. is a golden retriever, so. Yeah. That was out of his dark phase. He really needed something warm and cuddly to bring him back dark. into. Dark phase? What da is this? What, You'll have darkness? to listen to find out. Uh, bum, bum, and of course, it's GM'd by my lovely wife, who's below me. That's and I me. also am a player, too. And if you like spooky things like Hello from the Hollow Woods or anything like that, check out Malevolent. Malevolent.ca is also a thing you can check out. Uh, and here's the website. It is all the rage these days. <laughs> yeah. Joe's love a ham. And that's oh, where to I'm find so it. Sorry. Here it is. <laughs> Wait, here no, it is. No, no, no. Nope. 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 Keep going. Try again. No. Nope. Uh, nope. Wait, hold on. Mm. No. Nope. Uh, nope. nope. I don't know. We'll get it one day. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't do a Chris do. <laughs> dot com. I'll just mess around. Anyway, you can check it out. Just Google it. You got fingers. Anyway, uh, I think we're probably ready to get into this, right? Because this is a one shot. We want to give all the time we can to the Mork Bork. Mork Bork. Then uh, let's roll. Actually, before we jump in. Can you tell the audience and myself, because at the beginning mm -hmm. of the book, I forget, what Morkborg actually means? To be honest with you, I do Pop not know. Quiz. Uh, oh. I, I don't remember. Hold on. Oh, uh, I think it's Dark Fort, isn't it? Oh, Mork you what? know what? That, that would be correct. The original name of Morkborg was Dark Fort. Uh, and if you get a nice bundle like Harlan sent me, they send in a tiny little pamphlet that is the original game Dark Fort. So, uh, yeah, that yes. makes sense. That's nice. Cute. And it, it says it here at the beginning, uh, Morkborg is Swedish for dark fort. Oh, <laughs> and is pronounced Merkborg. So <laughs> we've been saying it wrong. But we would like to apologize uh, yeah. to any Swedes in the audience before we move and on. To the as as the and to the creators of the game. the creators who are totally <laughs> watching this. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. Yeah. watching. All right. It would be Without the first further time. ado, here we go. Uh, enter. Merkborg. 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 <laughs> of the world is nigh. So say the scriptures of Anuk Schleger and the prophet Basilisk Verhu. So say the blackening skies that gather over the grand towers and universities of Galgenbeck. So say the dead crawling from their graves and the steeping rot that grows in the common villages and the disintegrating embers of magic. But you are a scholar and you remember a different prophecy. Rarely discussed, never discovered. Meselmet the prophet believed the world could be saved, each apocalypse narrowly averted. And in this dire hour, you join with your fellow scholars, travel weeks across the valley of the unfortunate undead where Meselmet's final prophecies were entombed with his bones. Maybe they can save you all if you give it to Galgenbeck's rulers in time. Or maybe you are a fool. Tired of long hours and ungrateful students? You know only one thing, that the scroll would sell for a king's fortune at the wizard's market in Galgenbeck. And if these are your last days on earth, you will spend them in luxury. Fool or scholar, you stand on a wind-blasted jut of rock high over the valley of the unfortunate undead, a perilous path. Your mule balks nervously at its cart, tethered all too close to the entrance of the candle crypt. A large doorway is set into the raw stone of the mountain, two brass doors ornately engraved and slightly ajar. Just in front and to the left of the door, there is a rotting wooden desk with a brass plaque that says coat check. Sitting behind it is a small undead creature, its bones encased in metal, a lantern with a single flickering light for a head, 
and behind it, a pile of rotting coats, home to a several generations of rats. As you disembark the cart, uh, who's the first to put your weary feet on land again after a long day of travel? Scald pushes forward and steps off the back of the cart where he's been sleeping. <sighs> what nonsense is this? He says as he points towards the coat check. It, it reads I... coat check, I believe, huh? Scald. What does what does the audience see as Scald disembarks this cart and stumbles uh, across the stone ledge uh, towards the coat check? Scald is a short creature with a long nose, mousy features. His teeth are rotted and bent in all direction. He wears an eye patch, like I do, because I'm him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's got bent and broken fingers as if it looks like they've been hammered for a thousand suns and his skin looks wrinkled and warped as one who lay out in the sun to dry themselves. He walks with no cane and yet could desperately need one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brother Leogal, you uh, comment to him that it reads coat check as you uh, haul your dusty robes off the cart. Uh, who does the audience see in this character? From under the dusty folds of his cloak, Brother Leogal's waxy skin can be seen. He has long, dark, greasy hair, and he smells of ash. This is a man who has been seen practicing small manners of magics within the folds of his cloak in the dark hours, flickers of flame and jots of ice coming from within. He is a cantankerous motherfucker. And he <laughs> steps down from the cart, shaking his head at his companion. Not more cantankerous than me. I say as I take your hand. <laughs> Tankerous off. Chinook, ah. as you shake yourself awake after six hours of this wagon ride, uh, who do we see as you uh, begin to rest yourself from the cart? Yeah, this <clears throat> large gentleman gets gets off and leaps leaps off the cart onto the ground, a little less hobbled than than his friends, <laughs> uh, wearing wearing just the the most chic farmer clothing you've seen before. He's got great boots. They'd go, you know, people in the field would be killing for him. But they've never touched that kind of soil. It's very much uh, a man of the soil chic, but but never sullied his hands. There's no calluses on these fingers. This is the 5th century pre-stained jeans. Yeah, oh, totally. Friends, uh, I don't want to sit at the door all day. Why don't we get out the cart? We gotta get down in here. There's some, there's some uh, secrets we gotta find. Uh, just a minute, I gotta take a piss. And Ressi will hobble off the wagon and walk over to the pile of coats first, uh, think better of it, and go over to a bush to relieve himself. Uh, Ressi is a somewhat tall six-foot man, um, somewhere lying between his late 30s and early 70s. It is impossible to tell. <laughs> his face is a mass of wrinkles and split hairs of his beard. And upon closer inspection, you will see that his hands are covered in any number of thin scars, perhaps mm. those of paper cuts. And, uh, yeah, as, as sort of a trickle, uh, sort of echoes across this otherwise dry and dusty wasteland. Um, Scald, you've come hobbling over towards the coat check, uh, and the little creature with its uh, metallic, almost spindle hands uh, crossed on the other side says, can I take your coat? I don't wear a coat, but you can have this. And he pulls a used tissue from his pocket and puts it on top of the desk. You, it uh, kind of reaches out its hands to either side and then says, that will be five silver. Or mine then. And he takes the clinics mm -hmm. back. It returns its hands to rest. Our, um, excuse me, if you don't mind. 
the presence of all of these coats here indicative of the fact that a lot of people went inside and never came out again? They may return eventually, and if they do, they will find their coats taken care of. Is it particularly warm inside? You would have to ask the rats. Do we need a ticket, or can we just get past you here? I. You may proceed if you or... wish to carry your coat with you. Friends, I'm not you... keen on leaving anything behind here. Can you? Well, I mean, we can't bring the donkey, so yeah. can you? What is? Can we repurpose this for a donkey check? This I will do for free. Huh? Ta-da! <laughs> Interesting. Very... Do many people take you up on your uh, business proposition here? Well, look at the pile of coats. There has to be at least seven. Right, but well, two hundred could have come in. It's well, not well, much for their coats. Let's go. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, who is the first then to approach these kind of two eight-foot-tall brass doors? Uh, each one is engraved with kind of a large panel of uh, embossed figures. Uh, all of them seem, it seems almost to be a point of light hanging in the sky, which hordes of sort of peasants in various states of mania and frenzy uh, are kind of reaching up to, but it is out of their grasp. Hmm. I stride forward boldly to examine this beautiful work. Uh, it's, it's terrifying in its glory. I hang back, cowardly. <laughs> <laughs> As, uh, yeah, uh, Brother Leogal, you approach the door and find, you know, this embossed relief. Uh, a couple of inches uh, wide is the gap uh, right now, and you can peer in to see that there is, as one might imagine, a room beyond. Uh, a room probably about 20 feet across, formed of raw cave with a flattened stone floor. Um, mm -hmm. A room with a large pit in the center of the floor. Uh, it is lit by dim candles from a chandelier, but on second inspection, it is not a chandelier. It is a metal platform on a chain ringed with candles, uh, and a spool of chain allows it to descend into the pit. Um, there are three other people uh, nestled around the pit uh, very intently, uh, like old souls at a campfire. Uh, they appear to be in scholar's robes as well, and... Uh, sort of each with a, a long gray beard one very small and bent up one very tall almost to the ceiling with his uh sort of witch's hat um and one with a beard that is spiked in every direction and a, a scar across his face did you get their coats as well say to the uh, undead creature it just kind of nods its lantern of a head have you ever been in there the Yes, but a long time ago, I have been employed by the Candle Crypt to keep coats for a long time. Uh, do you know any uh, information about said crypt that you could share with us for, well, more than five silver? <laughs> I know only what I have been given, and what I have been given is that you may check coats at the coat check. Or five silver. Can I look through those for five silver? If you wish. I slam down five silver and I start rooting through all the coats. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coat now, check. Yeah. <laughs> check, uh, coats. check those coats. <laughs> Scald, we are going to do the first roll of the game. Ooh. So Ooh. You can get uh, bit by a rat. You now, Harlan. <laughs> this is a d20 roll. Okay. And you are you are adding your presence modifier to the result. So what's my presence modifier for those who don't know, including myself? Indeed, your presence modifier is a meager plus one. Gone are the days of D and D's beautiful plus eights and plus nines. Uh, modifiers wow. in this game are very small. Cool. What do you have there, Skull? We got a eighteen. An eighteen. Whoa. Sick ass. Voice. So, we will uh, as you go rooting through the pockets. Uh, yeah. You know, we're going to give you a couple seconds narratively. Uh, Brother Leogal and Rezzy and Chinok, uh, what are you three doing while Skald uh, turns over the pockets of your fellow academics? I look towards Rezzy 
and key knock and uh and shoot them kind of a curious look shake my head at scald this is curious behavior for a, a scholar there's, <laughs> there's people almost ahead of us. seems uh you gotta wait of... anyway <laughs> can we play through <laughs> golf mm. golf joke uh for the hole <laughs> Ah, yeah, the, the, the hole inside, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Vressi's just going to kind of look at Brother Leagall and over to Scald and then over to Chinock and just kind of shrug uh, and go over to the double doors and, and push his way through to the inside and yep. start kind of looking around and, and slowly walking towards the, the th- as I have in my notes, the three old fucks at the pit. Exactly. Finally, somebody's <laughs> doing something. Let's go. Yes, uh, yeah, Brother Legal, Chinock, do you uh, follow Vresi's lead here? Chinock's yeah, right I behind do. Him, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. As the three of you step in, you know, a couple more details. Uh, it appears there's a big lever that kind of activates this winch, uh, you know, lets the platform down into the pit below. Uh, there's like a small iron pot with maybe the dried out remains of what might have been at one point a stew sort of tucked into the rocks on the side. Um, and one, the very tall, sort of uh, wizardly looking one, who almost is a shadow to the ceiling, uh, he has sort of tucked under one arm uh, an owl uh, with sort of large black feathers that curl around like the horns of a goat. Um, but as you, as you look up, the sort of most perky of the three fucks uh, says, uh, hello. How do you do? Welcome uh, to the Chamber of Whispers. Thank you. Are you denizens of this place, or are you also seekers of the prophecy? Oh, uh, yes, we are. We are seekers. Uh, We uh, have spent many, uh, many a year here. Um, We uh, primarily uh, listen uh, to the, the prophecies that emanate from the prophet pit. Uh, but uh, on occasion, I have made small exploits down there as well. But it is not often that we get company, uh, and even rarer that um, the company comes back. But, uh, but what brings you, uh, a young faces, uh, to to our cavern? We seek the prophecy, of course. Hmm. By the prophecy, uh, capital V. I assume you mean the prophecies of Mesomet this year. One and the same, yes. Hmm. Well, I thought there's others here. Oh, oh yes. This uh, this place has been the burial place of prophets for nigh on three centuries. Uh, whatever the, they are die or you know miracle themselves unpleasantly or the church disposes of them then they are entombed here uh as a sort of uh sac- sacred uh, presence you consider this to be a holy place oh well, well the that's... church does and we should think about what that means is mm. that right brother Leogal? it is indeed uh, Scald, you sort of, uh, I imagine almost like Gonzo in the Christmas Carol, sort of flip back <laughs> up into the screen. Uh, and like rolled in your arms are uh, 50 gold pe- or fifty silver pieces that you have <laughs> like gathered from various pockets, well wealthy done. pockets left on these coats. Could you also roll me uh, what is called a D66? One Ooh. dice is the first digit, one dice is the second digit. So what do I roll? Two sixes then? Two d6s? Yep. Oh, that's cool. Uh, we'll go 54. 54? Oh, yeah, 54. Yeah. Uh, well, you have also come away with a smooth golden globe. Uh, it has oh, no mar- thank you. <laughs> I tried so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Good Gonzo joke. gets his due. <laughs> it's been so long. Who are you thanking? <laughs> I'm thanking God. Yeah. <laughs> the prophet Meslemed, obviously. <laughs> that guy with the lantern head who let me roof through these pockets. Oscar. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that said, you have a like golden, yay big uh, globe in your hands. It has no visible markings on it. Uh, 
but it has a nice heft, kind of like a softball. I pocket uh, it. Yeah. Anything I do, else? I don't know how this. Can I do a roll on it to see if I know what it is, or can decipher anything, or is it just? Gonna say like there's probably a, a messing with it roll, but the question is, do you want to mess with it now or mess with it later? Does it look dangerous? Is all I really want to know. No, it was okay. in some. I mean, it was in some guy's pockets. So perfect. I put it in, and I even cover it with a little <laughs> piece of handkerchief. There and you I go. Oh, nice. Oscar nice. And I say, well done. Thank you for that. Beautiful. And I give him another silver, because I just made a bunch. <laughs> and it kind of. Yep, stares at it, leaves it on the desk, and you walk inside uh, to find that uh, Brother Leogal, uh, Chinak, uh, and Vresi have sort of doubled the population of this cavern. Uh, huh. And the talkative wizard is the one with this big spiky beard. Uh, the very tall and aloof one has not said anything. Um, and the tiny curled up one next to the pit uh, seems to be almost annoyed as if the conversation is getting in the way of something else he's trying to listen to. What are they doing here? They're listening for prophecies from the pit. Yes. Have you heard yes. any? Have you heard oh. any? Oh, yes. The dead have much wisdom to share. Um, yes. Uh, uh, how, how familiar are you with, with candle cribs? Personally, we've never been here before, but... Minimally. Yes. Well, then uh, allow me, you may... My name is Vaxel Braxis, uh, the Elder. Uh, I, I am... You seem to be men of academia. I am of academia myself, in a fashion. Um, but yes, I have been here for quite a while now, uh, gathering the wisdom. And one of the things we have observed over time is that more and more of the dead prophets below have become less dead than they were before, which is a gift, a wonderful boon, because as they wander the crypts below, sometimes their mutterings of prophecy echo up to us. And so we listen for any glint of wisdom that might be useful to a wasteland and the realms. Is there any other means of egress from this room, or is it just down into the pit? down into the pit i'm afraid but that is more to keep them down where they belong in the crypt uh than for any other reason uh rest assured my uh my companions here uh this is albrecht the uh <laughs> the pale mm. and uh this here is uh wanton the meek uh, they are most uh, likely uh, the, the keepers of the winch, and they are uh, happy to assist any traveler who would like to go down. Now, personally, if I may be so bold, uh, I would recommend that you not enter the crypt, especially looking for a tomb as deep as Mesomet's without a guide, a fellow man of wisdom, someone who has navigated each uh, palanth of the labyrinth before, uh, well, one like myself, in fact. And how much would that be? Oh, uh, well, you, in fact, are uh, working on something which I think is of great uh, scholastic importance. Uh, discovering Meselmet's tomb. I, I, would, I would be happy to assist. It is what I have been working on as well. So you don't know where it is, then? I have it down to the last couple twists of the labyrinth, but... Uh, and here he uh, kind of like reaches into his uh, sort of robe and then seems to like think better of it and draws his hand away. Uh, but it is, a, it is a bit of a maze down there. There's quite a lot to explore, a lifetime's worth. Oh, so you would do this for free? Yes, yes, of course. Just uh, as, as long as I'm able to lay eyes with you upon the scroll of Meselmet, the prophet. It is the most valuable thing entombed here, I believe. Alternatively, how much would you charge for that map you're holding? Ooh. He uh, kind of <laughs> reaches back into his robe. Very astute, very astute. I have one uh, eye, but it's sharp. I can see that. Uh, I would be hesitant, given that this is my, my life's work. And uh, of course, um, 
if you do not know how to use it, uh, you might die down there and I would be without a map and you would be without a scroll. As far as knowing things goes, I believe the four of us have fairly capable brains. Oh, yes, I, I am sure. Which, uh, which universities and colleges have you come from? I am interested to hear news from the outside. Galgenbeck. Galgenbeck. Oh, Galgenbeck University. What beautiful towers, what wonderful classrooms and lecture halls. I remember it fondly, although I did not complete my line of study there. I was expelled. Drop out. Um, well, no, not a dropout. Nothing so <laughs> vulgar. I, someone else was uh, copying my essays and he would turn them in before I was done with them and he would get perfect marks and they would accuse me of plagiarism. So I, get, I resolve it myself. I leave a simple cut upon his chin and they expel me. Can you believe it? Uh, so I've turned my gaze to other places instead. Well, if the failed academic some. wants to risk his life along with the rest of us, I welcome the meat shield. Uh, I don't feel as comfortable with that as you do, Vrezi. That is an uh, untoward way of putting it, but uh, more or less, mm, veritably. Gal turns to his fellow academics. Look, he may say he knows much, but in the end... If he spent his life looking for this tome, who's to say he might not be using us? Uh, this is a great significance for us to find and bring back to the university. Should we really risk it to uh, someone of this nature? I too am trepidatious about inviting these seeming guardians along with us. Now, we're on a mission for good here. We're not out for personal gains. This is about finding a prophecy that's going to help turn the tide in these apocalypses and perhaps save us all. Who, who would take a personal cut out of that? that I mean, there, there's no gain here for us other than the, the knowledge and the experience of it. Don't and be naive. Of course, we are here for that, but not everyone is. The, uh, the sort of tall, shadowy one holding the owl and uh, the little gnarled up one just sort of both nod, interested. Uh, yeah, they, still, uh, Vaxelbrex is kind of just watching you to see what you'll Trust is a thing I don't give away easily. If the Elder here is going to turn on us, could be as easily as him as any one of you. I'm sure none of you have secrets you, you'd like to keep hidden. One more pair of hands to get us to the the prophecy we, we friends we've got no reason to say no winches do your winches win, get us get the winch ready friends we we got to go <laughs> winches get the winch if you know what i mean it's a winches get stinches ah, and scald looks to brother leo go i have a bad feeling of this fair enough if you're joining us perhaps mm. it would be wise to copy the map so that we have two in case we should get lost in the twisty tunnels from our generous guide who then perhaps leaves us. Well, I assure you, if I leave you, it is only because I have met my untimely demise. And if that be the case, then feel free to collect the map. I would be happy for my life's work to continue in some way. Well, then perhaps I could hold the map and the same argument could be made. That when I pass, you could take it back. Wouldn't that if, be a nice way to trust this person? To let them give us the map for trust? Well, if you would like to spend 40 years uh, making expeditions in and mapping the depths and be my guest, but otherwise I will retain my work as I am sure you are jealous of yours. Faxel Braxis, like I said, this is a mission for good for the world. Let us all gaze upon the map and memorize it to the best of our ability, and then get on the winch and get down to this, because we need to find it. Time is running out for the people of this world. I've I'm quick enough with a quill, and I take out my uh, little quill and parchment ready to make a quick <laughs> transcription. <laughs> you wouldn't put your life's work at a higher value than the whole world, would you? That would be a very unpious thing to do, Elder. Chinock, go ahead and make me uh, also a presence check. Uh, I'd this love is a, to. 
to d20, and then you are adding two to this result. Well, how do we like 15? We like 15 very much. Um, do you see just a moment of like weight uh, balance between his beard? And then uh, he's like, As, in truth, the greater good is what we are all. All academics are here for. Uh, for you, I will make an exception. And uh, as the very tall shadowy one kind of looms, drifts over to the winch uh, and begins to like lower the chandelier down to ground level, um, Vaxelbraxis rolls out across the ground, uh, just produces a voluminous scroll from inside his, uh, his robes. This thing is like three feet, uh, spreads out to five, um, and is almost like a, a, a spider web of various tunnels uh, that just intricately cover this entire map. And she's like, all right, so uh, you will want to take down this line, which will get you uh, to the tomb of Raktam, uh, the wise. But then at Raktam's, you're going to want to take a dodge right. You almost won't see it in the shadow because it's between the two big tombstones. And then you want to move the right. And uh, a couple minutes later, uh, you have more or less with some parts crossed out as he has backtracked on his own uh, words, mm -hmm. something of a map that should bring you to roughly the right place that he thinks might be the entrance to Mesalmet's too. Um, and well, by once now, it's rolled out, Skald doesn't even look at it. Yeah, <laughs> it, like, it was it was purely just like a uh, like a bluff check, right? Just, just he wants to know this guy's like. All right, you're willing to show yep. it. That's all I need. And he like steps onto the fucking lowering platform. Yeah, you know it kind of dangles. You step over a ring of candles to like reach the inner basket. Yeah, Skald uh, has this like old like wobble, and then he steps on the thing, and he's like amazingly deft at it. Like the minute he steps yeah. on, he just becomes fluid with the movement. <laughs> yeah, Chinook also steps on, just like getting on a horse. He says, and, you "Have know, you been on a horse?" The... Of course. A... They don't call me the farmer for nothing. I. The scholar of beast and crop, I am. Your boots are very clean. I bought them special for this adventure. Oh, this is your first adventure then. With these <laughs> boots. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure that James, the player, understands what's going on here. So mm -hmm. we're leaving behind all three of the old fucks. No, we're taking no, we're an taking old fuck. We're taking, we're ta yeah. okay, we're taking the one. The old chatty fuck. one. The loudy one, yeah. Actually, one tall uh, yes. So tell me, say you are to unfortunately perish how oh, do we yeah. signal the raising of the wench so we can exit this oh, pit so, so simply call up they'll be listening never will they be answering the the tall the tall one by the winch just like looks slightly offended as does his owl it's sort of with feathers droop uh yes of course why, why, why would they not because you may not come back Perhaps they blame us if you should perish down there. Oh, they are not my friends. Oh. They are my fellow academics. Rude. Fair enough. <laughs> Do they look offended now? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the the little gnarled up one nods as, as <laughs> agreeing. Oh, the well, big, a little extra, the... we can make sure he doesn't come back. <laughs> I want to bring the little guy. Than that to get through academia, that's for sure. Can we bring the owl instead? Well, the owl's <laughs> Just the owl? Yeah. Leo, Le do, you, do you want to approach this tall guy about the owl? Nah. Don't do it. Yeah. The owl will eat you. Let's go! And he stomps yeah. twice right. on the crane. Ting, yeah, ting, hop on. And roll up. Yep. Yeah. I roll up my um, my bad version of the cool map, and I <laughs> go on the lift. <laughs> I want to say, now, who has taken down a copy of the map? Is it just Brother Leo? I yeah. gave it a good look over. I but... didn't look at it at all. <laughs> But I'm not an expert at that sort of thing. I, you know, paper's not my friend. Same. Yeah. I am used Language to, is mine. I'm used to copying many, 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 many tomes as part of my job in the Abbey, so. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, then uh, as you each clamber onto this platform, which is pretty crowded by the time the fifth member of Axel Braxis steps aboard, uh, and here is a little map I made of uh, of the dungeon. Ooh, it's pretty yeah. awesome. So, I felt like it was a good time you, to share it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you are now descending, as they say, uh, a long way down. Do we and, hear any whispers? 
Oh, you will. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, like a, I think the most obvious sound is just this clang, 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 clang as this reel of like thick square chain links uh, rusted with many ages uh, just begins hauling through this winch in levers and uh, descending this uh, chandelier platform into the pit. Um, and for a couple of moments, you know, the the chandelier is exactly as big as the pit almost. Its edges sometimes like scrape the stone as it descends this almost well shaft into the earth. Uh. Um, and uh, there are just all these like guttering candles uh, near your feet uh, to provide a little bit of light uh, as you sink. Um, and as you continue to sink, uh, you can now hear just the slightest like mass of uh, but it is somewhat drowned out by Bax and Braxis, uh, who says, right, so there are two things to be worried about down Just there. for a moment. Quiet. What is this? Mm. Uh, the sound? Yes. The first of the two things are the undead prophets. They uh, are mm, sometimes violent and provoked. They are attracted to loud noise. Um, but stay very quiet, move very stealthily, and they will leave you be. Are you uh, saying anything? I think vaguely, yes. They are speaking sentences, but they come in these cryptic little uh, sort of sort of diatribes. It's like, the fields and crops, the fields and crops. <laughs> Drops characters get a, gets a hard on. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> How do you say uh, your character's name again? I keep forgetting. Chinock. Chinock. Okay, cool. I'm going to write yep. down phonetically. And as uh, as you begin to reach the end of a long way down, Baxter Baxter is like, uh, there is also the Lantern Keeper. Uh, you would do best to avoid that one. Uh, if the undead grow too rowdy, then the Lantern Keeper will come to collect them as a bit of a beacon for a head, a blinding light. Um, and if you stare at it for more than a moment, you will die. Sorry, uh, you mean the one who took our coats? <laughs> oh no, a much more dire and terrible thing. They he did have a guard. lantern for a head, didn't he? Oh yes, I uh, think that, but much, much worse. The guardian of these crypts. Um, you will uh, run if you see a bright light. That's all. That's all I'm trying to say. The quiet is the theme here. Quiet. Quiet is good. Does and... anyone else speak sign language? Can't say that I do, friend. Skull you... is a series of like hand signals. Very I'm not sure if like you I speak do. sign language either. Oh, I do. I'm the language professor, remember? Oh, oh, oh how could I ever forget? What? And That's how, all you've been how long have you been there? Whole time. Seven years. You? Oh, only seven years at the church. Interesting. Or at the, at the university. Interesting. I say I've, you. That's what oh, you I've, say, your years. Uh, every academic year I've had in my life. We're coming up on 35, I think. It takes that uh. long to become the... Preceptor Laureate of Beast and Crop at Gackel, at Gallenbreck University, St. Frugal College. A mere 35 years. <laughs> I was first taken in at the Abbey at the age of seven and have well, since been spending every single day devoting my life to this, this moment. And I think as you say this moment, there is a pfft as the last of the tunnel walls disappear. And suddenly the descent continues, but it has opened up into this huge cavernous space uh, that stretches just a hundred feet in every direction around you. Um, and you can see that beneath you, there is almost an ocean of light, uh, thousands upon thousands of candles uh, spread out across the floor, almost like rolling ocean waves. Um, and you can see on the rocky sort of ceiling a couple more of those little lantern-headed undead uh, reaching out carefully with these very long poles to relight and replace extinguished candles as they go out. Um, and for a couple moments, you are descending towards this uh, ocean of light. Do we see any of these undead scholar or undead prophets? Do you see none of them yet? I was originally going to ask how they replace all the candles, but uh, oh, that, that would do it. That would definitely do it. Yes, there are the minions of the Lantern Keeper, the uh, the wardens of this place. They do the maintenance. 
more or less. The church has thought of everything. They really light exactly what they want you to see. Mm. If only it were so easy. And then you are now at the level of all these candles, and then you continue to fall. And you realize these candles are not connected to the floor. Uh, they are held up on poles about 40 feet tall. Um, and you are now leaving the ocean of lights above your heads as you continue to sink down towards the floor, uh, which is almost like a forest of black iron candlesticks jutting into the air. Um, and he says, and now be wary of the prophet. Great. <laughs> There is a rattle as uh, the platform connects with the floor. Uh, oh. the, the light uh, far above uh, of, of the candles does provide like a, uh, at least a glimmer of light, but the sort of like just uh, forest of candlesticks on every side uh, kind of obscures like more than about 10 feet of vision in every direction. Um, it is kind of moving through a maze of mirrors in here uh, to get through these. Scald um, steps off and like yeah. just touches a candle just to move it, not to do anything, but to see how sturdy they are. Yeah, you uh, give it a no, no, and like real soft, like just yeah. kind of a you know, yeah. uh, doesn't move. And then he tries a little harder. There is like a slight kind of flex of the metal, but you know it's just, it's it seems surprisingly sturdy. It probably goes down into this stone floor a long ways as well. Hmm. They seem sturdy. How much, I don't know. Anybody mm. bring a torch? I can see pretty well in the dark. Yeah, there's a whisper of light. It should, obviously, with an experienced guard at your hand, uh, that should be all that is required. And, uh, you know, as Vaxelbraxis dismounts the, the chandelier, kind of busies his coat about him, um, you know, fluffs out the spikes of his beard and like casts a look off. Uh, I, I want the camera kind of like cuts to each of you for a moment. Scald, mm -hmm. as you uh, as, as you kind of <laughs> give this a shake. Uh, what, what what is Scald thinking right now? What is uh what what does the audience kind of see in Scald's uh, field of view? You see Scald look between each of his companions, a nervous eye towards each of them, and his eye falls upon Chinock, and he sort of nods to himself almost mischievously. <laughs> uh, Brother Leogal, as you step off of this chandelier, brush the edges of your coat over the guttering candles, um, glance up towards the forest of candlesticks. Uh, well, do we, what, do we, what vibe are we getting from Brother Leogal right now? Brother Leogal turns away from his companions and uses a moment where it seems like he's examining his surroundings to paw at an amulet that's hanging from his neck, something that is heavy and covered mostly by his overclothing. And as we see him pull this amulet aside, you see that the skin underneath is a tortured, inflamed row of, of hives and he scratches at the amulet the space where it touches his skin and then he readjusts his clothes and turns back to his companions uh, no I think it's better that we don't use a lantern down here to keep to the dark places for a uh, Vressi as you uh, step aside um, kind of gather with your companions uh, begin uh, a walk through this forest of candlesticks what do, what does the audience see in your corner Vressi is pawing at one of his many belt pouches um, and as he does so he's gonna kind of open one of them and stick a hand in and then just pull out just a handful of silver pieces and he's just gonna kind of bend over um and just mm. set one on the ground as he double checks that his laces are taut on his shoes and he's mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. ready for whatever may happen and as he stands back up uh, with his other hand he's just gonna place it on the hilt of his dagger Ooh, yeah 
And uh, as Vaxelbraxis kind of returns to the group ready to continue walking, Chinock, uh, what can the audience glean from you? Chinock has taken his backpack off, lovely new backpack, fresh leather, <laughs> sets it down and <laughs> opens it up. And inside there's a, a lovely wrapped parcel and he, he unwraps it and takes a handful of dried fruit and nuts and starts munching on that. And as he's putting it back, you know, lovely snacks, takes a slug of his brand new water skin. There is an old and well-used bear trap with some chain sort of in the other side of the backpack that he mm. uh, ties it up. And Smells of the of northern timberland. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, stained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so Vaxel Braxton says, now keep your eyes ahead of you so that you don't run into any candlesticks. Um, and if you should hear or see one of the prophets, keep very calm, keep very still. If they do not hear you, if they do not see any bright lights, then they will continue their path past you like honeybees. It's a very what? odd analogy. Does the smoke bee. work on them like honeybees? Mm, well, I, I have no, of course. I have been respectful enough not to light any great fires down here, but uh, if you wish to risk your uh, discovery, then it is on your head. And Vaxel kind of turns around uh, and begins with like one careful big boot step after the other, sort of toe stepping his way through the maze. Um, could each of you, assuming that you decide to follow, uh, I think, you know, the, the main uh, kind of initiative is after Vaxel Braxis, but do all of you follow? Or uh, is anyone, uh, you know, lingering behind a little bit? I follow, but I want to hang back. I want to speak with Chinock and Vrezi. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, and uh, Brother Leogal, do you uh, continue sort of in the wake of Axel Braxis as well? Absolutely. Okay. Lovely. So I'm going to have him sort of a few steps ahead. You're kind of walking together in a group following his, uh, his lead. And uh, yeah, Scald heads back first to Rezi, seeing him lay the silver coins. So we know which way we're going if we plan to return. That's the when? idea. I, I don't expect that the platform's going to stay down here forever. Clever. Good thinking. Smart thinking. Shinock, hang back for a second. Well, fuck Scald? you too. <laughs> and Brezzy will, will continue on to leave them alone. I complimented you. All the cool guys are up here. Language Join me. <laughs> Wait, no, you're in a language. What are you? You're. He's a words boy. Literature? Yeah. Yeah, I'm words. It's just we're both from Ga um, Gallenbreck University, and they're from other lesser colleges. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and Scald hangs back and walks along Chinock for a second and says, You were quite keen to have this thing with us. We're I... keeping pace. Any, any, any uh, friend, any advantage we can get to, to get this scroll out of here is just, I mean, that's the only important thing, right? This prophecy, life-saving. I mean, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a scholar of beast and crop. I've seen what's happening in the world out there to, you know, I've, I've done my own research and I, this, getting this prophecy out is, is really key for, for all of us. You think he can be trusted? I don't... I wouldn't trust anything down here. It's... And, I, and I think I, I take a minute to look right at Scald's one eye and say, I wouldn't trust anything down here. Believe you me, I don't. And I kind of like match that eye and keep pace and say, I mean, after all, there were over 50 coats in that pile. And I would wager mm -hmm. most of them asked for him as a guide as well. And he like pushes past you and kind of moves up to join the other ah, at the beginning. Wonderful. Meanwhile, uh, you know, as uh, Scald and Chinook have this whispered exchange, uh, you are beginning all to hear other whispers, uh, fragments of, uh, and then on the fifth day, the fifth day created. Absolutes too, uh, and 
Vresi and Brother Leogal, you have caught up just a couple paces behind Vaxelbraxis as he continues to sort of pathfind very suavely his way through these uh, candlesticks, almost as if he knows each of these identical many thousands of metal poles by heart. Uh, what are you two talking about in this uh, moment? That's a great question. I think Brother Leogal is, is a quiet companion here down in the depths uh, staring out and hoping to catch sight of something moving in the depths mm -hmm. yeah and uh, Vrezi uh, Brother Leogal kind of watches in uh, anticipatory silence uh, do you break that silence? Mm -hmm. I do I absolutely do I think this is the first time that Vresi has had a moment alone uh, with Brother Leogal yeah so, tell me, Brother Leogal, is it true what they say about your views on the different magics and what is considered to be clean and unclean? I've heard quite alarming rumors that your views might be counter to that of your precious church. Oh, Bressy, the church has very staunch views on the cleanliness of magic yes certain things uh, i should back up are you a man of belief i am a man who has seen many texts written over aeons of various beliefs and truths and untruths and he saids and she saids and the church follows this as all men do who is to say what was the original truth? And who is to say what is the current truth? Astute. I am much of the same belief, Vresi. The church is a creation that is made by flawed humans. You, I, Scald, Chinock. Who are we to say what is true and what is not true? What is clean and unclean? I have, over my long years, seen many instances where an unclean magic is the only way to bring about light into the world. <laughs> Practical. As ever. Brother Leogal, can you make me a presence check? I will. 14. You uh, spot just for a moment uh, something in the shape of a man, but mm. black and almost uh, dripping with cobwebs, uh, kind of stumble past a few candlesticks down. I put a strong hand on Vresi's forearm, just grasp it very aggressively for a moment. And I jerk my head to the side to, to draw his attention to this figure. And then I stand stock still and watch it pass with Vresi there in the darkness. It continues lurching on just, and then the stars shall falter one by one and die into the night. And uh, then with another couple shambling steps, it is gone back into the forest of candlesticks. Take, for instance, the fact that we are here in this dark crypt, Vresi, surrounded by the undead creatures, the prophets of our god. Death, necromancy, these are unclean magics, and yet here we are in and amongst them. I think Scald and Chinook, this is the moment when you catch up with these two. Hmm. Why have you stopped? So, uh, first prophet. Uh, yes. And we have arrived. Vaxel kind of steps through the last of these candlesticks uh, and gestures. And although the candlesticks continue almost to like the very edge of the wall, you see that there is a wall now. You have reached the end of this very large sort of circular room. Um, and it is covered in doors uh, of immediate like proximity uh, is like a very large door uh, covered with like 
sort of big brass filigree. Uh, a small one, almost like just a, a, a cave or a little carved out pit, only four and a half feet tall next to it. Um, and one on the other side, one covered with ornate figures that kind of mirror the uh, the the reaching for the light uh, embossing on the front doors. And uh, Vaxelbraxis kind of gestures to the first one with uh, the brass touches. It says, "Well, are we uh, are we set to continue? Your uh, nerve has not faltered." And just around you, there are hundreds of other doors. Every kind of inch of the walls of this place seem to lead into different uh, passages and tunnels. No now need to hesitate. Yes, we're all still here. No one's died yet. Oh, okay. good. Lead the then, way. Then let us go into the dark. And uh, Vaxelbraxis pushes open slightly uh, the, the panel of this big brass door. Uh, and uh, steps into the passage beyond. Hmm. Now Please the question... I'll, I'll yep. follow him. I'll go next. Okay. Beautiful. Bressy, Brother Leogal, you uh, step in after. Uh, Scald and Chinook, uh standing out here, do you uh, continue after? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm right in line. Yeah. All I right. wait a good moment before, and then right when they've walked in, I take out a small blade and I just scratch a mark on the brass door to denote Sheet. it amongst the others. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, and after and a I, moment, I follow, and like you know, just glancing back over your shoulder as you step into the darkness, uh, you just sort of hear the echoes of like that metal, that sound of a single sliver of metal being carved from this door, uh, and a couple of pairs of pale eyes off in the forest of candlesticks looking momentarily in your direction. I match them, and I smile, and mm -hmm. I enter. Yeah, uh, you step into the dark. What follows is a bit of a blur. Uh, in the way that climbing through dark underground passages barely lit every so often, every couple of hundred feet by a single candle. Uh, it, it is, I think, difficult after half an hour to tell whether you've been here for half an hour or three, uh, just how long you've been kind of climbing through. Uh, long sort of barren uh, passages of uh, just st rough hewn stone, uh, some passages that are more elaborate, uh, properly squared off and covered with funeral flagstones. Um, some passages with uh, sort of a network of skulls and other bones uh, kind of forming a lattice across the walls and intricate murals. Um, it, is, it is almost as if every prophet has gotten, depending on uh, the level of humbleness of that prophet, some have been given great murals and filigree and embossings and statues set into the walls. Some of them barely even a marker uh, or a line of text. Um, but nevertheless, these walls of prophets form the catacombs as you follow Vaxelbraxis through. Um, could uh, we get a presence check from everyone in the party? You know, it must be quite a... One. So they're all different, but depending on... Can I ask you a question, William, about omens? Oh, there. Yes. Are omens yeah. something that we can use after rolling shit, or do we have to choose to roll with omen up top? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for the benefit of the audience as well as our players, you have the group collectively has five of these things called omens. Uh, you can use them uh, to get, uh, essentially, uh, you could re-roll a bad roll, you could make a roll easier uh, so that if you see a difficult thing coming, you can try and burn an omen to make it uh, more viable, but you could also reroll something after you failed. The reroll is very tricky because you can use an omen to make someone else reroll something as well. Uh, if you Ooh. don't want them to have succeeded at something, for instance. This is um, also a collective resource, though. So do we all have yeah. to agree on its use or is... Uh, oh. No, but I think everyone yeah. knows when you use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. 
It's like uh, a physical an omen, thing. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in in proper game, it is an individual resource, but for this one shot, it's collective. Uh, I I'm love giving that. You, giving you all together five for the use of the session. You can also use it a couple different ways in combat, but we'll address that if we come to it. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we won't get there. It's perfectly perfectly safe. We'll get right to the end, find the prophecy, and no problems. Absolutely. Thirteen. Thirteen on Brother Leagal. Uh Sixteen. Uh, 16 for Scald, uh, for Mr. Bressy. Natural 20 for a 21. Oh, well done. Okay, and for Chinook. Lucky number seven. Lucky number seven. Okay. So, as uh, as you continue to make your way through this passage, um, there are numerous, numerous opportunities where, you know, the crypts kind of branch off into other spiraling directions. Um, and Baxel Braxis without too much banter, kind of leads silently on, as if he's afraid his uh, kind of flabbergasting self uh, might attract attention down here. Um, every, every time we kind of look off into the darkness, there's just this kind of calling emptiness, uh, but you do not see any, uh, any undead passing you just yet, um, until uh, just kind of like passing through one room, um, Chinook, you just kind of scuff your boots a little bit loudly and accidentally send oh. a skull rattling across the floor a little bit. Oh. Um, it is uh, it is Ooh. what one <laughs> it is one quiet noise out of you know a long uh, journey that has been mostly in silence. Um, but nevertheless, uh, from these like sort of flat stoned coffins that, that line the walls, uh, you hear a surge of whispers. Uh, going, no more rain, rain of blood, life of a child. Uh, and Brax and Brax just turned back and he's like, and uh, continues uh, stumbling on. They can carve these fantastic things on the walls, but they can't sweep the floors. Shut up. Quiet. <laughs> Got some dirt on your new boots, finally. Yeah. That's called says in a whisper. <clears throat> oh. We are approaching, uh, and Vaxelbrax just kind of like pulls out this map, inspects it for a moment, stands in this room that has these big vaulted uh, bone sculptures that kind of reach up to the unarched ceiling, and says, I believe we are drawing close uh, through the labyrinth. Now, uh, past this point, through this door, he points to an empty archway that leads off uh, to sort of a winding stone tunnel. This, I believe, may be uh, the entrance uh, to Mesomet's tomb. I'm not completely certain. It is uh, unexplored for me as well. Um, but this is, I think, as close as like, I can lead you uh, with confidence. So, just to be on the table, because you've been very suspicious, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. with the eye patch, what is your name? Scald. Scald, Mr. Scald. Uh, if some misfortune is to befall us uh, past this point, <laughs> I just want you to know it, it was not my doing. I, I do not know what lies beyond this twist of stone. Well, do you have a weapon at least? Oh, yes. I am armed with my academic wit. Let's see how that fares against the undead. Scott pushes him forward. <laughs> <laughs> with this sort of... Uh, he's tosses you a sore look and then stumbles on we're not gonna be another one of the many that didn't return because you left them here this time your life's on the line too bold accusations mr scald but rest no assured. accusations just fact there were 50 of those coats tell me now how many of them did you lead down here most of them <laughs> were not as keen to uh, share in their discoveries as uh, you were well, as my good friend Chinock said, discovery for one is a discovery for all in this group. I can Right, you. everyone? All that's important is the prophecy. I, I completely agree. <laughs> and uh, he continues stumbling on. Um, it gets to a point where there are no more candles uh, on the walls uh, and sort of faced with a pitch black passage. Um, he reaches into sort of a very small side bag, 
and pulls out sort of a, a, a stick with a burnt bundle of bandages. Uh, it kind of uh, strikes it strikes a flint to light a torch down here, and uh, sort of continues much slower now, almost trepidatiously, uh, testing the the feel of the stone beneath his feet uh, into the darkness. Is that anyone else picturing this guy naked for some reason? <laughs> I'm getting a very um, oh shit from the, like the Aladdin movie, the, the old guy dude when he's the old dude. Mm, yeah, when Jafar is pretending yeah, Jafar to is be the old dude. helpful. That's the, mm -hmm. For some reason, I'm picturing there's a Touch video game called The Long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm picturing <laughs> like, a, like a little loincloth and like a naked wizard with long hair. I don't know why. Just, I, although I'm picturing the very like uh, the beard co competition beard things where they got all the big spikes. Yeah, I saw stuff, those they, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. <clears throat> and I push him forward, and then <laughs> I hang to the back. Yep. Uh, and so over after another couple minutes, and again, assuming that everyone is sort of following behind this guy for now, um, he he eventually kind of holds up the torch to the ceiling. Uh, and the round passage, uh, again, very, I think, rough uh, carved out of the stone. Uh, it looks to be very old here. Uh, you know, every, um, yeah, it's essentially, like, you have gone very deep by now. The, uh, the weight of the earth above you feels uh, impossibly heavy. Uh, the air claustrophobic and long unbreathed. Uh, there are dust of stone stirred up by every boot step. Um, and he lifts up this torch uh, to inspect a square doorway that stands uh, in front. Uh, and inscribed upon it uh, in kind of 300 year old letters uh, that probably scald, I believe, our I language professor. It. I yeah. Past. <laughs> you, it says. You, Cloak Don't room. forget to drink your Ovaltine. <laughs> All right. He had to get this one. Uh, he had advertising just to pay for his own little crappy crypt down here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Who do you think is funding yeah. this expedition? No, it's the dude. Yeah, it's the dude from upstairs. Yes, it's, it's, <laughs> Thank it's you the, for being toured with. <laughs> it's the name of the prophet Gardettos. <laughs> yeah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Hello. The, uh, yeah, the, the inscription above, uh, in sort of, you know, the equivalent of Old English, despite the medieval times, uh, says cloak room. Coat room? Cloak room. Oh, that's too funny. Ah, interesting. I expect we might be close. What the hell does that mean? Is this where he brings the coats? Well, I could only assume that Mesomet's tomb was for some time after his death and passage of pilgrimage. Uh, perhaps they uh, set up a room for uh, people to check their belongings before entering. Is this, is this a common problem? I've been nowhere else ever in this world where someone's need. Is this a very normal problem for everyone here? Am I totally new with it because I don't wear a coat? Um. <laughs> he kind of murmured. was a problem and then passed. he like he he kind of <laughs> great uh, cloak uh, opposite of shortage he, of night he, he, he pushes on your shoulder scout a little bit as he steps past <laughs> you through the square door please please do <laughs> yeah and uh brother sort of Leogal is just muttering yeah. about like the the uh, unknowable uh, church and how the the saints uh, had many different phrases and words for things and how uh, coat cloak room could cloak room mm -hmm. could could mean like um like sex. a preliminary mm -hmm. uh, meeting place room. and yeah yeah something so, shrouded in darkness something. that's right yeah now my my main question uh, is who is kind of following him into this square room, or are you kind of hanging back and uh, you know looking at what 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 is everybody doing in this moment as he ventures into what may be the cloak room for the tomb of Mesalmet the Seer? Uh, Scald is going to hang back because, although I haven't said it yet, he is a Bowie. He's got a bow on his back. Um, yep. <laughs> so distance is his friend. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, Brother Leogol's going to hang back as well, not because he's a Bowie. In fact, he has a sword strapped to his <laughs> side, but he is 
keen on this creature triggering any traps <laughs> and, and not brother legal <laughs> yep scald and legal you hid behind a little bit what about i mean Kina? we'll go in i'm just i'm just gonna be last is basically yeah yeah exactly we're doing that yeah. thing where i'm like Obviously. after you You're like, after Sorry. you we're we're also bold because chinock was definitely thinking like i'd sure love everybody else to go in here first and then sees the others hanging <laughs> out and like well, friend, let's get to it, he says. And We're all pretending to tie our shoe. Literally yeah. fucking none of us are Indiana Jones. Uh, Chinook does have a a shining brand new short sword that he pulls yeah. out of his sheath and uh, uh, steps right behind to stay close to the light because uh, at least he's not in the dark then. It has that nice, nice new sword smell. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Skald yeah. says to Brother Leogal, you know, for a farmer, a professor who doesn't make much, He's got an awful lot of new things. Wonder if his expedition was funded, if you know what I mean. Well, that's not the only thing that is strange about Chinook. No, of course. He's... The smell. No. He's clean. What farmer is clean? More than that, I hear that he attends heretical poet societies, uh, buying and selling heretical texts. A heretic? Well... Really? Also, someone interested in offloading potentially stolen written materials, if you know what I mean. Well, well, well. And then I, I draw my sword just a little bit, and I nod, and I go in. And I knock an arrow, and I follow. <clears throat> yep. Uh, and uh, for Veresi, were you right up there with Chinock and Vaxel stepping in first, or were you uh, back with the group a little bit? I think I... Vressi pauses for a moment as he sees everyone kind of stealing themselves. And, uh, our wonderful guide continues forward. And I think Vressi is just going to step just inside of the cloakroom to try and keep an eye on our guide, making sure they don't go too far out of sight. Perfect. Um, and, but just stepping out of sight of everybody else inside of the small room, what I'm yeah. assuming is a small room. Yeah. With piles and piles of cloaks. Just so many <laughs> fucking cloaks. So... Uh, we will reveal what is in this room, but can I also get from everyone another presence check? And uh, pre presence pulls a lot of weight in this game. Uh, so Ooh. there's. I want to a... roll an omen on this. I'm one. gonna do it too. Yeah. <laughs> Two wow. gone. That's what it's for. Uh, Fifteen for Vressi. Sixteen for Scald after using an omen. Mm. Okay. Eighteen for Leogal after using an omen. For Twenty-one Leogal. for Chinook without having. <laughs> I have to say, I, I, every time you say Leo Gall, it sounds like you're saying little girl, but with like a speech, like <laughs> little girl. That's wrong. I'm Leo Gall. I'm a man. Okay. No, I know, but. Like, uh, and remind me what the role for Bressy was. Um, fifteen. Fifteen, beautiful. All right, so, uh, for really Chinook and Bressy first, but then the other two peering in through the door. Uh, as Vaxel Braxis carries his torch across this room, um, he slowly, like, you know, in the sphere of dim orange light, you can begin to make out what lies on the other side. There is a large sort of rotting wooden counter uh, set off to one side, kind of a long hallway type room. Uh, behind it are a number of uh, sort of uh, uh, oxidized brass hooks. Some of them have fallen from the stone. Uh, some of them still contain uh, sort of black rotting coats uh, hanging from their many spots on the wall. Um, there is a constant drip from the ceiling, which is encrusted with lichen, black water that uh, kind of drips down and pools onto the floor, which is an elaborate mosaic. Uh, and as Vraxis is uh, kind of walking across, you can see the mosaic letters that spell, leave your burdens and enter the tomb of Mesalbet. And he slowly reaches the end of this room, uh, which is another big square door descending down into a passage. It's kind of like a long ramp almost. Uh, but you can see at the end of, uh, of this room uh, that that passage uh, is almost completely filled with black water, uh, the same as uh, pools uh, here in the cracked tiles of the cloak room. Mm. Uh, and uh, Vaxel kind of turns back and he says, uh, I fear I may have encountered an obstacle. Uh, 
And then immediately, as he says that, um, one of the cloaks <laughs> leaps into motion, uh, a dark shape flapping out from between the, uh, the, the rotting forms, um, and <laughs> encapsulates him and the torch with it. Uh, leaving you all in momentary darkness for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, for the two that hung back a little bit, Leogal and Skald, um, you can now hear uh, whispers growing louder and the shuffling of bare, uh, long dead toenails on stone uh, from the passage behind you. Uh, could everyone uh, roll for an initiative? And rolling, yeah. for, an rolling for initiative in, uh, in Morkborg. It is going to be a d6 roll. You will add your agility to the result. <laughs> Three. One. Three also for one. one. One's uh, good, four. right? One's the yeah. highest. It's the yeah. number, we're number one. Exactly. It's golf, golf rules. rules. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a four I heard for Chinook? Uh, four for Vressi. Four for Vressi, one for Chinook. Now, you want to rock, uh, paper, scissors this, Rob? <laughs> uh, one, two, three, shoot. Sure. Why don't you do it off camera and bring it in so that you don't. Oh, smart. Okay. So timing's not Yeah, yeah. All right. One, three, two, two, three, one. shoot. Oh. We're dead. One, two, three, shoot. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Three, this two, one, me. shoot. One, two. <laughs> oh, fucker. <laughs> You know what? You go first. I'll go second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's all. funny. It's an endurance right. game, rock, paper, scissors. Right. Not many that's people right. know that. Yeah. It's now, an endurance game. Uh, we are essentially, you know, not going to be quite as restrictive as D&D in terms of combat. You can do quite a bit more during your turn, uh, but, you know, you can kind of attack once and do other stuff as well. Uh, so we're going to, like, keep the story going, but we'll kind of flash over to each of you suddenly as this action begins. Um, oh, beautiful. All right, so... Uh, another thing to point out with Markborg, uh, here, instead of uh, 20 different sort of options for players' monsters, you have player initiative and monster initiative. And you guys have won the initiative, so all of you will get to go first before anything else does. Uh, so, we go to Vressi. Uh, your world has just been plunged into pitch darkness. Um, you are standing just inside of this cloak room. Uh, the torch uh, that Baxel was carrying has been swallowed along with his form by shadow. It is pitch black all around you. Uh, you can hear only the trickle of water, the muffled screams of Raxel, and the whispers echoing down the hall beyond. What would you like to do? Uh, I want to clarify some things. Yes. <gasps> do we hear the scraping of undead toenails in the cloakroom? Do I hear it coming from outside the cloakroom through the door? It appears that when someone kicked a skull earlier, uh, it took them a while to break open their uh, their coffins, but you have attracted some attention. So they've they're so now from behind us. Yes, exactly. Um, do I have anything that could cause light? Yeah. I uh, I, I, I'm going to say uh, most people would probably have uh, a torch or a tinderbox or something. Okay. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, as long as you think Vressi would have packed it for this expedition, yeah. then, uh, yeah, you have it. Okay. So, uh, do you do you strike up a torch, then? No. Fuck no. <laughs> uh, Vressi wants to is is everybody in the room or is it just me and I think Leogal Olnash... and, and Scald Le... are like on the in the yeah. hallway. Le Leogal yeah. and Scald are a couple steps behind you. Chinok is like halfway across this hallway room and Vraxel is at the end, uh if there's anything left of him. Great. What's the thought that's going through Bressy's head right now? Beyond just, oh shit, <laughs> this is uh, dissolving fast. Uh, I don't want to... I want to see what's happening, but I don't want to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think at this point, what's going through Bressy's head is we were in this room yep. for at least a little bit of time with a light source before anything happened. Yes. 
It's just a question of, was it the sound of somebody speaking that woke something up that does not like light? Or was it just the sound? Mm-hmm. Well, there are sounds now. The There's sounds of Braxel Braxes screaming as if from very far away. And the sound of thrashing uh, as he stamps his boots on the stone. Vressi is going to light a torch and throw it to the side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you Almost it, like a flare. Yeah, it bounces with a clatter. Um, and all of you can see now, uh, A, that in the passage far behind you, there are just sort of these cat-like green discs of eyes uh, slowly approaching, not yet there in the light. Um, and on the far side of this cloak room, uh, Raxel's boots are standing there, but his legs disappear into this thing that covers him like a black cloak over his head, over his shoulders. Um, but as it shuffles and shifts, you can see that it is made of feathers. Um, and in between the feathers, kind of a leathery tissue. Um, and then you see like a flash of eyes. Uh, this creature seems to have like these large feathery falling apart wings and it has completely blanketed his body uh, and he is thrashing against it trying to get it off as it uh, continues it seems to maybe feed on him maybe take its blood through a proboscis who knows what horrors are happening beneath that cloak uh great the map <laughs> yeah i think uh we'll, we will go over to uh scald Scald spin. Oh, go ahead. Yep, you're towards the back of this room. You're you can now see towards the cat-like creatures that are coming. He pulls his bow and he fires at them. Yeah. All right. You are going to give me uh, what I believe is a, a strength Presence roll here. Twelve, right? Oh, ranged. That's uh, yeah. Sure, we'll take it. I don't know. Just as combat. Yeah. Nope. That would be a natural one. Sick. I think they have crit and fumbles in this, don't they? They do. Oh, uh, here we go. Attack. Weapon breaks or it is lost. Oh, shit. Cool. Fuck. Yeah. So, yeah. I, that didn't take long. I, Did you bring any extra bows? Well, I think we're going to say that, like, you pull back your bow, a bow that has served you quite well throughout this. Too long. Uh, yeah. Um, Should have bought a new one for this adventure, just to say. <laughs> and in your hands, oh, you hear sorry. a... <laughs> and as you look, like, just over the wrapping of the handle... You see that someone has partially cut through uh, the, the the wood of it, um, and with that cut, as you apply the pressure, it snaps apart in your hands. You know, you now have just two sticks on the, on a on a long, uh, waxy line. Ah, Shitty nudge turns towards the others, <laughs> and he's like, "Someone sabotaged my bow. I'll kill you for this." And he turns back. And uh, he runs inside the room. Okay, yeah, dash into the cloakroom. Uh, you know, there's an, uh, there's a lit torch on the side floor. Uh, there is Vaxel Braxes still squirming as uh, this thing like flaps around him. Uh, and then there is that black pool of water uh, on the far side. Uh, where do you think you're going? Me? Yeah. Probably running towards the pool of water. Although I have a suspicion we need to be naked to go through it. <laughs> Does that suspicion really call to you as you stand with your boots slapping in this black water? I'm you trying kind of to push remember. Past Braxil, said, still down squirming, your and like shove him back. Uh, well, you I'm know, trying to remember what the writing on the floor was, though. Yep, it said, "Lay down your burdens and enter the tomb of Mesomet." Yeah, with cloaks, burdens. I don't know. I kind of got the impression that it was meant to be like stripped down naked to get through. So my um, real question is, is Scald stripping naked in the middle of this <laughs> scene of bloodshed and monstrous No, monsters? I think I, I think I'm probably overthinking it. I think I think Scald probably runs and uh would dive in. Yeah. I mean he doesn't have a weapon. It it wouldn't it does there's no option, right? I'm not the gonna... water just hisses and bubbles around you. Uh as you begin swimming into briny unknown depths. The last flickers of the light of the room left behind you as you swim and hope that you can hold your breath long enough to find Oh, something. I can. <gasps> yeah, so beautiful. Uh, that'll do it for Scald. Um, for Chinock. Chinock is leaping out over to get to, to Vassal Braxel and try and like yeah. 
Friends, there's some kind of deep bird here with feathers in the dark. Got to wrestle it off this guy, you know, trying to like yeah. find a neck and pull it yeah, up. You know, 100%. like he's collecting a sample for the university. Just Make me a uh, strength check here. As you like lay your hands upon this thing's feathery wings and try to wrench them free of him. Yeah, 17 minus two, uh, 15. <laughs> okay, so gonna gonna give you some options here. All right. Uh, because left alone, wrenching against it, uh, it is going to maintain its grip on him. Well, if you would like to burn an omen, I was going to uh, say I would let you retroactively do one of the omens effects, reduce this difficulty by four, and give you uh, give you the win. Yeah, I I think I think we're going to spend the omen to to reduce this difficulty. While I don't know a dark beast with feathers from underground, I've wrestled lots of beasts in the wilderness. Or I've read I've read about it at least. Yeah. <laughs> Are you right. Jack or are you? you uh, <laughs> it's a combination. <laughs> you uh, w w just you know this this dark uh, moment of energy courses through your veins, and despite your uh, you know your brand new gear and uh, you know untested uh, strength, you find it in yourself to rip the creature free, uh, and immediately it kind of flumps back. Uh, to like hang in the, the corner of the ceiling for a moment. And you can now see. Uh, this is a beast not commonly encountered uh, near Galgenbeck, but I think you've at least probably heard of one in your many academic years. Uh, this is a feeder called a ragpi. Uh, it has four big wings uh, connected with sinew, uh, covered in dissolving feathers, um, a sort of jagged little mockingbird face with four beady black eyes glinting in the low torchlight, and a long jagged beak that it uses to pierce into its victims. And you can see that Vaxel has this massive wound like stuck uh, into uh, his shoulder and rib cage. Uh, he's kind of like, thank you, thank you, uh, as he like stumbles free. And the ragpie kind of like up in the ceiling, like just looks between all of you. So you have freed him. Uh, the question is, where do you want to go, if anywhere? Or are you happy sort of here in the middle of the room next to the only source of light? Yeah, I, I mean, I am I would love to grab Vassal Braxel's torch just to, even if it's out at the moment, just to yeah. be relit in, in a minute later and kind of stand by him. Uh, you, you like, lean in, <laughs> grab his torch from him in the, in the low light. Uh, and as you lean in close, he's like, you're a good one. I'll share it with you if we get it. The scroll. The prophecy is the most important thing. Yes. And his eyes kind of look to the darkness below. It is. Um, I, I think we'll switch over to uh, Brother Leogal for a moment. Uh, you have been uh, kind of hanging out in the doorway. Uh, you can see now that, you know, those eye glinting eyes from the hallway are shambling closer. And now, even in the dim light, you can see uh, one undead prophet missing most of its jaw, uh, another uh, that has its hands kind of like clasped uh, into its own face, are both uh, shambling uh, down this hallway towards you. Yeah, uh, I do not intend to... All this, all this chaos in the room, what would you like to do? I do not intend to stick around and wait to see uh, how these prophets are going to say hello. So I dash into the room... Um, and given that this rag pie is no longer encompassing um, the only guide that we have, I'm going <laughs> to try to attack it. Um, yeah. And hopefully it won't uh, be able to hurt anyone else in its short life. Beautiful. <laughs> you uh, pull out your sword and, uh, you know, dash across the room, try to stab up into the ceiling at it. Go ahead and give me a strength roll here. Okay, uh, 10. And, uh, you know, you get a plus one to this. So, again, uh, alone, that will not cut it, but there are two omens left on the group. No, I'm happy so to fail to attack this creature. I, I have a, a quick question. Yeah? In this moment, would mm -hmm. I be able to do some magic? Uh, yes. I, I'm going to let Leogal kind of... Uh, 
Uh, Leagle, you've stabbed at this thing, and it like just almost like latches onto your sword, kind of tries to bat it away with its wings. Uh, are you uh, are you sticking here at the end of the room uh, as it does that? Oh, if I if I fail to hit the creature, I'm gonna hold yep. fast to my weapon, like yank it free, and then jump into the pool after Scald. <laughs> okay. Ah. Yeah. And as you jump into the pool, uh, we are uh, we're gonna be back to Resi. What what would you like to cast here? Uh, well, I was hoping I could cast something to aid Brother Leagall. But oh oh yes, in that case, uh, uh, to to improve 100%. that role. But if we yeah want no, to push past I, that, I'm happy to. I let's uh, let's do it. I okay. to be honest, I forgot you had that. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, what uh, you are going to have to do then, Brezzy, yeah, uh, is make me a presence uh, check. Okay. Uh, this is you attempting to cast this spell. You're going to need a twelve. Okay. No, no, not even, not even a little bit oh, close. No. I got a three. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, Woo. Okay. What, <laughs> what were we gonna yeah. see? <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's a mystery. In that, in that case, like you know, your uh, and what does it look like as you read from the scroll? Is there any visible effect that the rest can see? Yeah. So I pull out uh, my my magical scroll and I kind of uh, open it just a little bit and I start trying to run my hand against its edge, trying to just get a little bit of blood out of it. Um, but as I do this, I think I'm frantically doing it. I see Brother Leogol, uh fighting with this thing with his sword, and I panic, and it doesn't work. Brother Leogol runs, dashes into Splash. the water. Uh, yeah. And I think at that moment I realize that it's, it's not happening now. Uh, yeah. And I just quickly grab the scroll and shove it back into my coat. Beautiful. Now, the way magic works here, uh, <laughs> and we're going to style it a little bit, but each time, now that you have failed one spell, mm -hmm. each time you cast another for the rest of the session, there's going to be consequences. Oh, bless the system. <laughs> so yeah, take two uh, D2 damage or something? Uh, that and then you know maybe other stuff. And you get dizzy and shit. Yeah. Yeah, man, maybe worse. Yeah. So uh, that said, uh, I believe uh, we have both Scald and Brother Leogal diving into the uh, the water. Correct. That's right. At yeah, this so very moment. Okay. I've been swimming for a while now. Oh no. So uh, yeah, uh, Chinook, Rezi, uh, standing in this room on the mosaic floor. You watch as the magpie like. Uh, just gives out this shrill, rattling, metallic cry uh, across the room, and then goes and launches back onto Vaxel Braxis. <laughs> uh, at this time, like his body kind of spins as it catches his momentum, uh, and then like tumbles sideways he to did. the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, he stops uh, twitching this time. Um, and who was it just now that had pressed up against him? It was Chinok. Yeah, uh, he's. I'm, pre I'm right you, there, yeah. You look down and find that tucked in your arm is a lengthy vellum map. Nice. Gave you his map. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even ask to give it to you. He just gave it to you. Okay. You know, that's, I guess that it worked out in the end. Yeah. Dead guys, uh, right? Rubbed his map up on you. The magpie continues yeah. to rattle like a, a stick in a barrel as uh, it feeds on uh, Vaxel Braxis. These... These folks who jumped into the water, yes. is that the only way out of here? Is that is that like an obvious direction to go, or did they just jump into a pool and were... Your exeunts now are as follows. One, a pool of dark water that leads down into a water-filled tunnel. Gotcha. Uh, not a great option. Option number two, the doors which you came yeah. from, which are now home to two clawing prophets uh, kind of peeking their heads in. Yeah. Also not ideal. Which of those directions would you like to go? Yeah, uh, dashing over to that to that water. I'm strip shoving naked. The, strip naked. No, we don't. Shoving want to the see map that. into the backpack, making sure it's all sealed tight. It's fresh. It's waterproof. Everything. Good roll top. Good. Oh, Snacks yeah. included, and uh, we're we're diving in. Dive in. Four naked priests. Vressi, uh, you watch uh, each of your three companions jump into this water. Do you choose to follow? Uh. 
Yes, but Vressi is going to pause for but a moment. Yeah. Um, pull out a, a pen or a pencil or a piece of charcoal and mm-hmm. just quickly write uh, several words on yep. the paper. Ball it up, throw it on the floor, and then dive into the water. Mm. Okay, beautiful. Now, uh, each of you, in your own moments, and we'll kind of address the you know the order uh, that this happens. But each of you, one after another, reach a point about two minutes into the swimming. It is lightless. Uh, you are there. You are pushing up against the top, but there is no air, no place to resist. Uh, just the, the the rocky, wet surface uh, and the untold uh, darkness beneath you. You reach a point where your lungs are burning. And that is the point where you have, with absolute certainty, the knowledge that if you continue, you will not be able to swim back. You might get lucky and find air if you continue. If you do not, uh, then you might be able to get back in time still with your breath. There is no sign of your companions. Gold Um, hesitates. Not at all. He doesn't even, he, he knows, he's like, it's that moment he's like, oh, I'm too far. Perfect. That's where I want to be. And he keeps swimming harder. Okay. Um, for, uh, for each of the rest of you, what does that choice look like? Mm, Brother Leogal flounders around looking for someone to grab onto in a moment of panic, probably just to kill both of them at the same time. Um, Finding no one, um, he continues to scramble through the water like a a newborn kitten. He is not a great swimmer, but he does uh, persist. Okay. Chinook. Chinook thinks back to some of the stuff he's written as part of the Libertas Poetica, the Freedom Poets, and and about how, like, this is really the only way out. The church controls everything else in the world. They've made up this fake apocalypse that they keep selling to us, and the only, way to, the only way for freedom is to get this prophecy so I can make it rich and get out. And I'm... It's that or death, and I might as well die in the dark cave in the bottom if I can't make it out of here with riches. So I'm holding my breath and pulling as hard as I can to find something on the other side to see if, you know, I've got the courage of my convictions. Vrassi. Uh, Vrassi just keeps swimming. Yep. All right. Then for each of you, as you continue to plunge deeper into the darkness, can you each make me a toughness check? Here we go. Ooh, 19. You. Good, I'm spelled. Is it you, 19? Uh, you at mine. Oh. <laughs> so we've got and those I'm, omens there, huh? There are two, <laughs> yeah, I was there gonna are, say. There are two omens, but I'm going to offer them in the order that you all jumped in. Where you go? Six. Do you want to re-roll for an didn't omen? Did I jump in first? Yeah, but you didn't need uh, one. You it doesn't say it. I didn't want to use one. <laughs> Do you want to use an uh, omen, Harlan? Yeah, who you who rolled well? <laughs> yeah. You did. All right, roll uh, roll us a second. You know, we'll no, no, not it. me. I want someone, someone who rolled well to roll again. Oh, <laughs> terrible! What a terrible behavior, uh, brother uh, Leogal. That's no, it's good, it's good. It's good. It's good. Brother Leogal, that's a six. Would I'm absolutely like? going to roll Use again. Nope. Are you kidding me? All right, I don't want to die in this black water. Group, roll again. Natural twenty. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I'll make you re-roll that. Not, <laughs> not, only, not only do I survive, I find the omen and I uh-huh. escape. Uh, Harlan? <laughs> yeah, I got, I had. Are, are, sure? you, are you serious on that? Or no, are you gonna let just the net teasing. Beautiful. No, because I'm, I'm logically, I'm a whole round uh, yeah. ahead of Brother exactly. Rugal anyway. You, you, got, you got some time. Yeah. Um, Resi, uh, what do you have there for toughness? Also a natural 20 for a 21. Hey. Okay. Uh, and lastly, for Chinook. So I got an eight right now, but yeah. I hear there's one omen left. One omen and, left. You know, as as I'm drowning and the lights are flashing in front of my eyes, maybe there's a little inspiration that pulls me to a sixteen. A sixteen will cut it. Mm. That is all the omens gone. Uh, and 
as you each plummet into this cavern, Scald, you, your lungs burn, but you continue on. You dive deep. Uh, and you feel the cavern ceiling get bigger. Um, and suddenly, there is a source of light, a flickering somewhere high above. Uh, there's not necessarily room to breathe here, but somewhere in this water, there is a source of light. Enough that you can see a glimmer below um, of a large stone coffin, uh, just a massive plinth uh, that upon it uh, vertically is engraved mesalmet. Um, mm. And you you are uh, the first to like kind of touch boots on this thing. Uh, and that is when you run out of air. Uh, kind of realizing like this stone lid has got to weigh close to a metric ton. Um, and I won't be able to open it? You uh, give me a, uh, a strength check while we're at it. Oh, you mean to say I'm still underwater, there's no You're air. You're still underwater, there's no air. If there's you want no... desperately to try and claw at this stone lid in the vain hope that it will move, give me a strength check. I mean, if there's any other air pockets around here, I'll look for those yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, what you look up to uh, is sort of a couple shadows pass over your head. Mm -hmm. uh, Vresi and Brother Leogal. Uh, and they are there for a moment. And then they disappear out of the water. Like um, push off and jet yeah. up towards them. Come up. And Chinook, just as your lungs are about to explode, uh, you can just see a glint of this drowned tomb. And uh, <laughs> Skull's boots disappear into somewhere in the ceiling. Uh, you clamber out as well. And you find that you are each sitting uh, or now sort of like clawing desperately up uh, into a small round chamber. It is a small cave. There is air. To call it fresh would be an overstatement. But uh, mm -hmm. there are uh, thousands, uh, maybe, of candles uh, hung from elaborate rows and drying racks, um, each, you know, still on its, like, connected by the wick, uh, big vats of wax and cold water. Um, and a little woman uh, who has hauled you each out of the darkness uh, and sort of like deposited you on the uh, on the on the stony ground. A little gal. Uh, and, and she says, uh, uh, <laughs> you are truly unwise to come this far down to the crypt. We Could... seek the prophecy, the, the tome of Meselman. Yeah. You see that uh, she has a little uh, a little lantern and a brass horn, uh, kind of affixed near the door, um, and she says, "Well, many have tried, but few have ever gotten this far. Uh, you should have learned by now that pursuing that prophecy would be the death of you." <sighs> she kind of pats Brother Lego on the back to get you to spit out water a little bit. What do you suppose we should do then? And who are you <coughs> to say that we'll die here? I am the Lantern Keeper. Now, why have you come to seek the prophecies of Meselmet? I love the pregnant I love that we're all there. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Skull looks around the room. There's no prophecy in here. There, what, there, there's a door. Just out all the supplies to make an infinity of candles. Uh, there is a little stone door, uh, and it seems to lead into a small rocky passage, similar to some of the ones up in the main candle hall. Chinook goes to speak, and and as he does so, he he opens his jacket where he's had stitched this this uh, scroll that has some words on it, just to double check his pronunciation. Yep. before he tries to say, take us to the most valuable thing here right now in a Ooh. way that would compel her to do that. Oh. Using yeah. the Enochian syntax that he had Go ahead recently and... purchased. Indeed. You, you say this, you read it. Go ahead and make me that presence check to uh, try and cast the spell. 17? Ooh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and immediately you see like... <sighs> Her eyes kind of like change colors momentarily. For a second, they are all black. For a second, they are all white. And then they're, they're back to normal. 
uh, and she says, it is unwise to try these things on me. Now, Skull I'm, takes a wide step away from <laughs> she, uh, she, the, this tiny old lady uh, just kind of like stands glaring at you and she says is that why you have come to for value to sell the prophecies of the genius well, the... money came is for of freedom. course a motivating factor yes but truly I believe that because the apocalypse is truly upon us. I need to be able to take the scroll out of the hands of those who would try to prevent it. We are in a cycle, brothers. Skull and the end up towards the water. Is nigh. <laughs> Brother Legal draws his sword. You're you've lost it. The church has blinded you. They're the ones who created the prophecies. They say the world is ending, and then they feast on the riches of all the people the coming church. to buy the indulgences. No, the, the church is a hollow yes. bird. The church knows It's a nothing. corrupt institution preventing us from living our lives. That yes. is what he believed, yes. And soon it will all be over. Why have you come? Well, if I must be honest, if we are truly to lay down our burdens, I think I join the rest of them and say I'm here for a fat paycheck and I will <laughs> drink myself to death rather than sit through this impending world's doom. Scald, as you turn back to like look at the you know pit in the middle of the floor that you just came yeah. out of, you see something sort of beyond it on the other side, uh, which everyone has their backs to right now. It is a stone table, and on it is a decaying body. Um, each like bone of it has been delicately wrapped in metal, uh, just a couple parts of its ribs still exposed, and it has a lantern for a head, uh, currently unlit. Uh, it is half covered by a tarp. Interesting. Does this look yeah. like Mesalmet? This looks... I'm not sure uh, that's apparent, but it looks like this is essentially still in construction. This is the un this is underwater? The, nope, this is uh, oh. in the workshop. Uh, oh, you sorry, know. okay. Yeah, just uh, near, near the uh, pit you crawled out of. Hmm. Okay. Uh, she, she kind of backs away towards the door a little bit. Um, and she says, it was not intended for people to come and sell his things for profit. That is why I moved them. I've hidden them somewhere that you will never find them. No tomb thief, no Barrow White. They, they will be lost. Uh, they will wait for someone who truly believes. Uh, and then with kind of like a almost cataracts over her eyes, she begins scurrying out through the, the tunnels out of the workshop. <laughs> Fitting then the end for us here. Now, I think Rest. we're going to get into yeah, uh, Brother Leogal continue and then we'll get into our kind of big beats here. Your silver pieces are for nothing. That's all. Does the creature with the head, does it look like is there anything that could light it? There's uh, a number of lit candles in here, yeah. I don't know. Scald looks eyingly at the way they came in. Mm -hmm. We could never swim that thing out. I... <sighs> but I bet it'd sell pretty good. Oh. Who now? <laughs> Should we chase her down? <laughs> she said there's nothing here. She, you could just hear her footsteps disappearing. So uh, I'm going to tune in here to each of you for a little bit of action. And these might be our final beats, depending on what those are. Mm. Skull. You stand, uh, I, I think, go ahead and make me a, uh, we'll take a presence check here. Sure. Just want to see if your memory is jogged. Well, I have an idea. 
mm-hmm. of something important that I have yep. that I think might can't come into play. But sure. I'm also wondering if that's the thing that I should just be getting the fuck out with and selling. But anyway, I have a 13. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think with the 13, at least, like just from looking around, uh, it appears she takes the bones of profits, uh, makes them into these uh, candle keepers to uh, watch over the crypts, just as you're judging the table. Uh, the water is black. There is a little pit of a hallway that leads out. She is rapidly disappearing down it. Brother Leogal has called out for despair. Um, Chinock and Vressi uh, still mooting over their thoughts. Everyone seems in it for the gold at this point. What are you going to do? I chase after her. Yeah, gas disappeared down the hall. Brother Leogal, you stand here uh, as Skald scurries away like a rat away from his fate. Uh, a black pool of water on one side where the prophets are entombed um, and a a long passageway into what might be hope or what might be utter folly. Mm -hmm. Uh, What would you like to do? Brother Leogal advances on his companions with his sword drawn. And you thought, what, that you were going to save the world? Keenock. Folly. Okay. Do you take a stab at anyone? Um, I'm going to wait to see how they respond to me. Chinook, Rezzy, Leogal draws a blade, walks towards you. What do you do? Um, do you want a moment, Rob? Because I know exactly what I want to do. Do, do <laughs> your thing, yeah. Great. Uh, Rezzy just kind of looks at Brother Leogal and over to Keenock. I don't like to fight, and I think if it's up to me, Brother Leogal, I wish you the best. Uh, But as I said before, I do intend to die by drinking myself to death. And Vressi is going to pull out um, a, a bottle full of this red liquid. Ooh. And just go over and take a seat on like the bench, uh, a nearby stone, cool. and, and kick off his boots and take off his hat. I stab Kilnak or Chinock oh. in the <laughs> face. Yeah. I stab uh, him right in the face. Yeah. What I, what I, love is, I gotta go. She's gotta yeah. go. Bye, <laughs> Joe. Have a good night at work. Bye, Let's Joe. Bye to Joe. Bye, Joe. She tries to stab Chinock in the face. Yeah. I do it and I kill him. Tries. He's dead. <laughs> Chinook, uh, Chinook. There is a, a, a shudder as a blade pierces through you. Brother Leogal on the other side. How, how do you respond in that moment? It's just ruined your nice new vest. Damn, I always knew the church would kill me. <laughs> uh, and I stumble over to where Vressi is leaving the blade in and slump yep. down on the bench and open my pack and pull out a sandwich and and my other things just to see if there's anything there just to have a last meal as the the last hope of real freedom kind of dies down here with that yeah. stab wound and and yeah. as you do that and you're there kind of munching on the sandwich sitting next to Vrezi you start to feel him shake and convulse and gurgle as uh, this white foam comes out of his mouth and soon he's just still Ooh, poisoned yep. himself. Poisoned himself. Nice. Uh, on the other, way. on the other side of the room, yeah, I, I think it'll do justice to say, uh, Brother Leogal looks back at you, uh, still stabs. The sword is still in you, um, and says, "Which way out will you choose?" And uh, takes a step off back into the pit of black water, uh, mm-hmm. and disappears into the depths. You are now alone with a corpse. Uh, a black pool of water, uh, hundreds of flickering candles, and the boot steps of Skald disappearing into the distance. Oh, Skald's gone already? I ran mm-hmm. after the lady. Yeah. Um, yeah I... You are, for the record, bleeding out. Yo, no, for sure. Like, and that, That's the thing. I think best case scenario i could pull this sword out of myself and feel a lot of pain and then die or i could just kind of leave it in there and make peace with the with the fact that this is a pretty neat place not many people have died in 
<laughs> and I'm going to choose this one, I guess, because not a lot of options left. Maybe I'll reach over and see if there's anything left in that bottle what, to wash Ooh. down my trail mix. And uh... Just a drop. A slow a... drop. But it is, in some ways, uh, a, a nice slow descent into nothingness. A I single think... drop left for me. Typical. For for Vrezi, as you shake and convulse, you know, your pale eyes are staring up at the ceiling until finally you go still. What is it you're seeing? What are you looking at in your final moments far beyond the uh, empty cavern ceiling? Vrezi is, is thinking back to everything that has happened in his life to the, the first time that he realized that texts really are just words and they are not what the truth is it is what somebody's truth is or wants the truth to be and he thinks back to to his writing his little note he scrawled before diving into the pool trying to lay down his burdens uh one final time his truth the truth that he knows uh and that is written as we, you know, the camera kind of pans and a prophet, like hands covered in spiders, uh, reaches down in this now empty coat room and like picks up the piece of paper with its pale eyes and kind of unfurls it. What, what, what is written upon? Uh, I love that. Uh, what is written is, I betrayed them. I have killed before. It kind of repeats those words like a prophecy over and over and over again as it shambles back out into darkness. Chinook, you too, uh, moments after uh, Vresi finally goes still, uh, have a last bite of trail mix, the uh, dried plums and raisins of far off uh, valleys that you once helped to nurture. Uh, and then with just a drop of poison, uh, you do not quite foam and shake as violently, uh, but you do feel uh, your veins growing slower, uh, your blood turning to ice, uh, and this candlelit room kind of growing blurry around you. What is it you see as you uh, fall asleep here? He, Chinook is, I'm staring out this, this hallway that um, Scald ran off in, into, and just thinking about how strange it was to meet this old friend and he didn't recognize me so many years later all twisted and weird looking but just kind of kind of left asking those last questions of of like the mortal life not really even contemplating what's beyond it never mm -hmm. never crossed his mind he'd get there yeah and, and as it goes white and then black it, it's just void a void that is punctuated by the flap of boot steps upon rock. Scald, you dash through these empty <laughs> underground hallways, just chasing the light, chasing like this woman with her little walls. candle as she like dashes through. Uh, and then suddenly you are into a much better lit place. You fall out of one of these little tunnel openings in the giant room full of candlesticks. Um, and you see her for a moment through the forest of candles. Uh, as she places uh, the brass uh, horn to her lips uh, and raises a, a, a like a little floodlight, a, a hooded lantern. Um, I hold my hand up to stop her. Wait! I'm not who you think I am. I'm not like them. I think you are a thief. I think you are here for gold and nothing more. I think you appreciate not what my beloved spent his life trying to tell everyone. That is and not me. That is them. But that is not me. She lowers I, her blinding lantern just slightly. Then who are you? I, unlike them, am a true scholar. And I came for something that was not down here but something that was on the outside. And I reach into my bag and I reveal the golden globe that I found mm -hmm. in the coats outside and I hold it up. Mm -hmm. This is the only prize I wish to take. One what, that was not down here to begin with. That is it. 
He slides it back into his bag. It is not of mine. You... I, I, will, I will escort you out. I will let you safe passage out, and then you will leave, and you will never come back here again. Of course. Agreed. She nods, and uh, kind of beckons you, leads you through this forest of candlesticks. It's called limps to the platform. His legs the, sort of The stiff. candles of this platform chandelier have gone out now. Um, and there is just a, a clanking uh, in the darkness as... Uh, uh, she, uh, she sounds her horn. And as she does, um, A, you hear the clank of these, uh, this chandelier uh, beginning to rise. But as it, as it does, you can just see you're clooming out of the darkness. She holds one little candle, enough to reflect in the eyes of dozens, if not hundreds, of prophets, drawn by the sound, stumbling out of the forest, raising their hands up towards the light of your chandelier as you ascend out of the forest of candlesticks. And then you are in an ocean of light, without your guide, without your so-called friends and academics. Uh, and then you are in a small room where a tall wizard and a small bent man uh, simply exchange a sorrowful glance as you emerge alone. Uh, the lantern keeper stumbles past the room, kind of blindly, uh, out the front gates and stands there holding the lantern. And she says, it is, it is time for you to go. Can I get my coat back? No. And Scald. Uh, Limps up the stairs, heads back to yep. the donkey. Make me a presence check as you re exit through these doors. Sure. Eight. I think what you can gather at least is that she keeps glancing to the things sitting in front of the desk. Uh, almost as much as she's keeping an eye on you, she is keeping an eye on, on it. Uh, and she kind of backs away towards it, lays a hand protectively on the desk. Uh, and says, uh, you've got your cart, you've got your life, be gone. Does it look like the undead thing would it, would attack me otherwise? Uh, it is small, it is skeletal, its bones have been wrapped in metal, and its lantern of a head just pivots to okay. watch you. Scald stops and turns to her and nods. Good luck with all that. And he <laughs> pushes himself up onto the cart smacks the donkey and rides off just as four more adventurers arrive behind <laughs> <laughs> as uh, you know we, 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 we pan away uh, to Scald you know kind of almost in a montage of you traveling alone back through this wasteland what does Scald's life look like as you heft this golden sphere in your hand uh, you know what, where do you go from here what does the rest of Scald's story uh, conclude Scald like all of them, mm -hmm. was a fool. But unlike the others, I think he saw the value of becoming a scholar in it. Skald's entire life was a deception. He killed the man and took his place at the university. He called himself an academic in name alone, and yet being down there with people who were just as sinister as him in his heart awakened something in him that he never really truly understood. He yearned for the glint in the eye of the students. He yearned for the pursuit of knowledge, even in the world's dying days. And in that moment, he had a true change of heart, something that he never anticipated, seeing how he could have been in these three other people, mm -hmm. made him try again. And he rode back to that school to try, I think. Yeah. And so many months or many years later, when the final red day comes and the seventh prophecy comes to pass, as the world grows dark and shudders, the sky begins to crumble into embers and the sun begins to close like a giant red eye. What goes through Skald's mind? What have you accomplished in the time since then? How do you cope with the end? Skald welcomes the end. He knows that he gave it his all 
and those last years before that red dawn he felt like he had done more than all the previous lives lived because he never gave up he saw the world bloody but unbowed and pushed forward and he smiled in the end yeah and you hold kind of in your lap smiling uh, a golden globe and in its reflections uh sort of the dying rays of the sun uh you see three faces uh kind of looking back at you uh through the gleam of the gold uh the face of uh Vrezi, uh the manuscript uh maker uh the vo the face of the farmer and the face of uh brother leogal who uh had so much to teach you about the end and as the red sun slips uh into darkness completely and begins to go out we kind of pan over to a very far away mountain a ledge with a brass door and a little desk uh there are two chairs behind it now uh one for the thing with a lantern for a head and one for the lantern keeper and as she watches the sun of the world go out uh she puts a hand on the remains of mesalmet uh and says I'm glad we were together for the end, my dear. And then with a, the sun goes out. Uh, there's a couple moments of darkness. And then the Invictus stream presented by Harlan Guthrie sort of <laughs> flashes onto the screen. <laughs> Thank you everyone, it's been a great Ooh. night. Great job, wow. That was what a story, way. William. Uh, <laughs> yeah, killed it. Uh, that so much, was everybody. amazing. Yeah, that was so fun. What a gorgeous world that you created. Yeah. And such a creative and clever. I mean, we messaged in the chat privately <laughs> while we were doing it. We're like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if that's not an ad, well, I know, I mean, this wasn't the intention, but I mean, if, that, <laughs> if that's not what I was going to say, if that's not a motivating factor to check out uh, Hello from the Hallow Woods, then I don't know what else is. But I realized it sounded like you didn't make the game to advertise your show because that would have been shitty. But yeah, yeah, yeah. what I mean to say is, if you love the creative flourish and the color put into color put into this dark world, uh, <laughs> then it's a great sell to check out Hello from the Hallowoods because William does everything on that show: writes, acts, uh, you know, from top to tail, just like amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, so wow, much. yeah. And, Thank you so uh, much, William. That was a blast. That was yeah. fantastic. That was absolutely I, fantastic. And now Maybe that we're in the post, I just want to say for the audience, every person went in uh, sort of thinking they were the fool. Yep. Uh, I expect some of you probably already deduced, uh, you know, how that would play out. Uh, but wonderfully done to all of you, sort of uh, probing for those little hidden details throughout the night. That was wonderful. I, I made a gamble at the beginning, like right when the game started, I wrote, everyone's a fool calling it now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was really cool. And I think everyone played it really, 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 yeah. really yeah. well. I quite uh, like getting the secrets and trying to find the ways to weave those in at the, mm. I think that was very fun. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was really good. I, I really enjoyed Level of that. deception type stuff. Yeah. Uh, mm. No, that was really fun. I, uh, and I mean, I was a fool as well. I yeah, just, every, <laughs> everybody yeah. was, you were just yeah. a fool who had a margin of growth. Well, no, I mean, to at me, the end I of always... the day, you weren't trying to save the world. You were trying to survive, and you found value in something else that wasn't just cold hard cash. Well, I always see. Um, so uh, William mentioned like a little bit of Green Knight inspiration, and like mm. I realized if we all go the same way, then it's just it's always nice story wise to get kind of angles for everybody yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I'll tell you, if you had not have narrated us out of that uh, lift, I was going to push that woman off. I was going to wait for the doctor <laughs> to push her off. Just to be the oh. ultimate like dick in the end and have her die on all these candlesticks and have me walk away. To... I like the redemptive little bit at the end. That's nice. Yeah. I played with it. I was like, the minute we passed that, I was like, cool, now I'm a hero. That, that'll be the yeah. way I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just letting role players out there know that you don't have mm -hmm. to do anything until you put it down on paper. You don't have to I feel like in a very anyway. horror movie way, like the audience saw that happen and then cut back to you and on then the it cut lift, back. Yeah. Like, it was a, still thinking. What do you call it? A descent, fake ending. Yeah. You know, if they yeah. whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, that was so much fun. Thank you so much for running that. That was a, a real blast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well. Thank you so much for Rob and James uh, for making it out tonight and uh, An for playing pleasure. some games with us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Arlen, where can we find Rob and James for those in the audience? 
Well, James, of course, we can do right at our at our family, our brother show, Dimension Door Podcasts. Yeah. Uh, huge, huge love to you two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and of course, uh, Rob is at our Dyshame Podcast. Dyshamepodcast.com. The URL I definitely know and uh, you know what? would never you, mistake. You only have to do an amazing job in acting in the show, and you do that already. So you, you've you already are. done your job. So, uh, yeah, you check out both those shows. Dice Shame, obviously. Joe, GMs, and I play in as well. So Rob's already like family. So if you liked what he did tonight, check out that show because it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but, okay. yeah, that is it from us. Thank you so much again, William, James, and Rob, and Joe. You had to go. Yeah. She works, unfortunately. She's on her way to work right now. Uh, that is it from us. As my good friend William always likes to say, Never put your toes in the washing machine. Never put your toes in the washing machine, friends. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>